You miss an opportunity if when we're worshiping the Lord, you don't use that, op- that time to step into the presence of the Lord. Uh, it's, it's not entertainment. It's not about my favorite song or not. You know, we, the Bible says we come into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. And that's purposeful and intentional. It's not passive. It's not like if God wants me, he'll, you know, we have to decide we're going to approach the Lord. Yes. Amen. You know, it'd be the same as saying, well, you know, I guess if the Lord wants me to work out, he'll drag me to the gym. No. Good luck. <laughs> the devil will take me to the cookie aisle at the grocery store. I know that. <clears throat> but I, I think we, too often, we, we forfeit something. The corporate praises of God's people are a very significant um, part of our worship and our relationship with the Lord. And to let that deteriorate into styles or whatever, we we forfeit far too much. So I would encourage you to, to come early, to find your space, to get settled in, to have greeted the people who were near you, to, to be prepared for church to start so that when worship begins, you're ready to enter into the presence of the Lord. You've already prayed. You, you've kind of cleared all the frustration that comes from being on the roads of Middle Tennessee. <laughs> Can we do that? Yes. Folks, it's, you know, there was a time and a place where we, maybe that wasn't needed, but I think with where we're living today, I, you're forfeiting too much if you, you come in five minutes late and you're rushed and you barely got the kids dropped off. And, they had to work the check-in counter because you missed it three times and you lost the love of Jesus. And <laughs> so if, if with just a little, I know it's with families, I know it's, it's a contentious few minutes, but it is worth the effort so that you don't forfeit big chunks of that opportunity. Amen. Don't take that off my preaching time, okay? <laughs> what are we doing here? Uh, offertory prayer. We have... We are learning the values of corporate prayers and the proclamations we make together. Uh, thank you for your faithfulness in giving and your generosity. Uh, it's, a, it's a part of our worship. It's not, a, it's, not, it's not by accident that the offerings throughout the Scripture, when God introduced that idea to His people, they, they were all an expression of value to them. It's an agricultural society, and every offering had a monetary value to them. So what we do with our stuff is as much a part of worship as what we do with our mer- words. So I thank you for your faithfulness. But for our offertory prayer tonight, I want to do something a little different. A couple weeks ago, I don't remember which service. I really don't remember which service. We did a proclamation together. Why don't you stand with me? If you're at home, you're going to have to get oriented really quickly. We're going to declare Jesus is Lord to the north, south, east, and west. And then we're going to give thanks to the Lord like we actually have something to be thankful for. So I'm going to ask you to think about all the good things the Lord has done for you this week, this day, this month. I know there's stuff that he needs to do. I get that. My life too. But we have something to be thankful for. But we're going to declare Jesus is Lord to the four points of the compass. Now in this building, that's not too complicated because it's pretty square with the world. Behind me is north, which means behind you would be smart group. Okay. I'm stalling for you at home. You can figure it out. Get your, get your phone out. Ask Google. Because some of you have no clue whatsoever. All right. If this is north and that's south, this would be east. east. Yes. I bet you could spell Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> we want to declare Jesus is Lord to all four points of the compass and every place in between. You know, there's a day coming when the Scripture says that every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Every knee will bow before Him. Whether it's in heaven or the earth or under the earth, every being, every living thing will declare Jesus is Lord. You know, we live in a time where that's contended and contentious and all sorts of back and forth and nonsense and foolishness and, you know, voices speaking into that. But the day is coming when the uniqueness of Jesus... And the supremacy of our Lord will be declared over all creation. And you'll see him in all of his glory. And this is our opportunity to be early adopters. 
We're the Jesus people. Everywhere we go, we want to say, do you know my Lord? His name is Jesus. Amen. I'm so excited about him. He's changed my life. He's washed me and cleansed me. My life was a mess, and I met Jesus. Amen. And you look kind of messy. You should get to know him, too. <laughs> it's the story we have. It's a whole lot better than church or worship services. If you're not excited about Jesus, you either don't know him or you don't think about him enough. If you think he's going to take something, what do you think you have that he needs? If every knee is going to bow and every tongue confess, just exactly what in your closet do you think he was really looking at with envy? I promise you there's not anything there. The amazing part is he would take on the liability of Alan and let me into his kingdom. In fact, the Bible offers no explanation for that. It simply says he loves us. It's one of the mysteries of Scripture. We get all heated up about how old the earth is or the, the sequence of the end of the age. You know, we get all, for somehow we don't have any trouble believing God loves us. It's the great mystery of the Bible to me. I mean, I, I, I believe you don't, you understand why he loves you, but I bet you know somebody you think, I cannot imagine why God loves them. <laughs> all right? And the Bible makes no attempt to explain that. It just simply declares that God loves us. So we want to declare the Lordship of Jesus. How many of you have a magnet on the back of your car that says Jesus is Lord? How many of you have been embarrassed because you had a magnet on the back of your car the way you were driving? Don't raise your hand. It's okay. All right, we're going to start with the north. I'm going to turn my back on you. Don't sneak out, okay? All right, we're going to do it on three together. And use your outdoor voice. You don't have to be disrespectful, but don't whisper. Sometimes we worship the Lord like we think, we're afraid something's going to happen. <laughs> you know, I, was, I grew up in church, and it wasn't like this. The minister wore long black robes and vestments. I don't ever remember seeing a minister smile. If they, I, I'm sure they did. I just don't remember. And there were, there were rules in church. You shouldn't laugh. Right? You, you didn't talk. You, you, you might whisper if there was an emergency. Right? You never turned around and looked behind you. If there was a bomb blast in the foyer of the church, you better be looking ahead. Because if you were in one, you know what? Your parents' arms were like 11 feet long, and you get that head slap from down the road, right? And the overriding memory was that it was not a, you didn't enjoy it. It wasn't quite as bad as the dentist, <laughs> but the seats were usually uncomfortable. Yeah. You know, you'd kept shifting, but if you shifted too much, you'd get the blessing from the anointing. <laughs> of the, right? But out of all of it, it was a place where there was certainly no emotion, there was no joy. The best part of the whole day is when they, they said that final amen. Yeah. Everybody found enthusiasm. We got out of there like it was on fire. <laughs> And we, we've got to unwind that, some of us. It's appropriate to, to worship the Lord with enthusiasm. Amen. But I would encourage you to do that. Some, I'm far more enthusiastic with the Lord when I'm away from you. Yeah, that's another day's discussion. All right, Jesus is Lord. You know your lines? All right, to the north on three. One, two, three. Jesus is Lord. And to the south. Jesus is Lord. To the east. Jesus is Lord. And to the West, Jesus is Lord. Now let's give him thanks. Lord, we praise you. We worship you. We give you honor and glory and praise. You are worthy above all. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let the name of Jesus be exalted in all the earth. Let the darkness be pushed back. Let the wickedness yield. We praise you, Father. We give you glory and honor and praise and thanksgiving. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Before you're seated, I want you to find two or three people and say, I'm glad to know a fanatic.
Hallelujah. Amen. All right. I hope you received an outline when you came in. If you didn't, maybe somebody near you would share. It's a biblical principle. If you're online, you can download one from the app or the websites. They're not biblical principles, but they will help. They're certainly part of God's provision. Who would have ever imagined we could preach the gospel around the earth from a little country church in Tennessee with the help of technology, huh? God is good. Amen. He is good. We're working through a series on spiritual warfare and the end times. The Bible is a, is a presentation of spiritual conflict, spiritual warfare. But there are some unique attributes that are a part of the story as we approach the end of the age. And there's a good bit of information around that in Scripture. And I think it's appropriate for us. I'm not prepared to say that uh, we have, we're in the, the final whatever. It isn't clear to me whether it's the end of the age or it's just the end of the empire. But I can tell you the current trajectory left unchecked is the end. There is disruption before us, and I believe that can be changed or altered or revisited. But what we are doing is unsustainable. No, no, no fear intended in that, just awareness and preparation. So in this session, I want to talk a little bit about intercession and intervention. I keep getting interrupted, a bit of a disclaimer on the front end of this. The, the, the Bible reading that we do together um, sometimes interrupts my s schedule. <laughs> you know, I'll sketch out the outlines for a series like this, and then I get into the Bible reading, and I was like, oh, no, that's on point. And I'm like, oh, no, just hush. And then the next day we get it back out, and I'm like, oh. So I, I interrupted my schedule a little bit. It's on point. But if I were going to lay out this series in chapters of a book, I probably wouldn't have put this session in this spot. But I think it's very coherent with what we're talking about, Amen. about spiritual warfare. Uh, last weekend, I told you a little bit about Neville Chamberlain, Prime Minister of Britain, who's, who is remembered in history because of his commitment to appeasement. He thought he could avoid conflict in Europe in the years leading up to World War II by appeasing evil. Didn't work out real well, even with the, the help of the media and the censorship that they were able to put in place. It led them to the brink of war. And Winston Churchill followed Neville Chamberlain as the British Prime Minister. Chamberlain is remembered for something else. He led the country to victory at the end of World War II. He was... Um, Interesting character. I don't know how much history you know. You know, he was a person of excesses. They didn't really particularly like him. But the circumstances got so dark and difficult that they were grateful for him. Um, he's noted, he was a very quotable fellow. Uh, I brought a few. They, were, they just make me smile, some of them. Ch Churchill said, success consists of going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. <laughs> Works for me. He said, success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It's the courage to continue that counts. This one's appropriate. He said, for a nation to try to tax itself into prosperity is like a man standing in a bucket and trying to lift himself by the handle. <laughs> if you don't understand, go home and try. Continuous effort, not strength or intelligence, is the key to unlocking our potential. This one's good. He said, the price of greatness is responsibility. Now, the list goes on and on. He was a very quotable fellow. But in the darkest hours, really, of the British Empire, when it looked like maybe all was lost, his determination, his perseverance, and his presentation of courage to the people sustained them. Maybe his most famous quote, the only thing they have to we have to fear is fear itself. Well, we live in a time where there's tremendous fear and where there are powerful voices saying that the best pathway forward is appeasement. Uh, I don't agree. 
In fact, I would submit to you that for the church, for God's people, it's time to move from appeasement to advocacy for the truth. It truly is. I believe in ways that we've never been asked before. We're going to have to say no to ungodliness. In our homes, we have to begin there. We have to stop excusing it. We have to stop accommodating it. We have to stop all the things we have done. We've winked at it. We've nodded at it. We've relabeled it. We have struggled with this. But we're going to have to do it in our churches as well, and there's not a great deal of appetite for it there either. Then we'll have to say to no to ungodliness in our schools. How long will we continue to advocate for wickedness in our schools and be passive? The fact that someone raises their hand and says they, wants to be, they choose to be wicked does not mean that position should be encouraged, defended, and protected. It's still evil. If they're preying on our children with destructive things, if they're sexualizing our small children, it's not a position that should be respected and defended. It's wrong. And the church is addled and confused. I believe wherever the Lord provides us with the opportunity, it's time for us to begin to tell the truth. Our reality, at least in my lifetime, is we've spent decades accommodating evil. We've even developed a culture and a language of capitulation. You'll, you recognize it when you hear it. We don't, in polite company, we don't talk about faith or politics. We're to separate the church and the state. Well, that argument only works on one side of the equation because the state has no problem meddling with the church. Amen. We don't want to offend unbelievers. We want to build bridges of understanding. We don't want to be judgmental. I mean, after all, aren't we all sinners just saved by grace? I mean, we have a whole vocabulary of capitulation. Our cowardice combined with very little fear of God has resulted in a church that is anemic and for the most part feckless. So I have some questions. Actually, we're going to try to answer them from Scripture tonight, so they're not just rhetorical to me. Does our faith belong in the public square? Should our faith affect how we do business? How we select leaders? And if so, how? Should we discuss our beliefs at work? Should churches engage in discussions regarding current events? I, I promise you those questions would have seemed absurd to the church throughout history. Even to the church in the book of Acts. Now I mentioned our Bible reading. We're working through the historical books. First Kings and Second Kings and I just couldn't get past some of this, so we're going to step into it for a minute. I think it's on point with our topic. If you don't agree, sorry. <laughs> First Kings 16. By this point in Israelite history, I, I know, I'm sure you know, there's been a civil war and the nation of Israel is divided and there's actually two nations. It's the same geographic footprint that was Israel of King David and King Solomon, but after Solomon's death, there's civil war and the nation is divided. The northern kingdom is Israel and the southern kingdom is Judah. If you need a historical parallel, just imagine for the American Civil War, it ended with two nations. Well, that's what happened in Israel. And so the historical books give you the history of both nations simultaneously. They tell you who's king in Israel by comparing who's king in Judah and how long they've been on the throne or vice versa. If you don't know that, it's a really confusing part of the book. So in 1 Kings 16 and verse 29, it says, In the 38th year of Asa, the king of Judah, the southern kingdom, Ahab, the son of Omri, became king of Israel. And he reigned in Samaria. Samaria is the capital city over the northern kingdom of Israel. What's the capital city of the southern kingdom of Judah? Jerusalem. This really is a smart group. He reigned in Samaria over Israel for 22 years. Ahab did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. Well, there you go. How many of you would like to make the book for being the gold standard of evil? I mean, there had been some scandalous characters before him. 
Verse 31, it says, He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, up until Ahab, Jeroboam was the gold standard. He's the one that implemented idol worship in the northern kingdom. He's the one that told the people not to go to Jerusalem any longer to worship the Lord, where they were commanded to go. He had been the standard, but when Ahab came along, the, uh, the, the language that the author uses in Kings intrigues me. He said he, he considered it trivial to be as wicked as Jeroboam. He said Jeroboam was in the shallow end of the pool of evil. Ahab got out in the deep water. He also married Jezebel, the daughter of somebody from somewhere. and began to serve Baal and to worship him. And he set up an altar for Baal in the temple. And he built, and he built in Samaria. And he also made an Asherah pole and did more to arouse the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than did all the kings of Israel before him. So, you know, in summary, and it's an important note because he's an important character. Abraham is uni Ahab, I'm sorry, is uniquely evil. Establishing new standards for dishonoring God. We're watching some of that. I mean, they're not new of the course of human civilization, but in our lifetime and in our culture, we are walking out new ways of dishonoring God, mocking God, with a brazenness we are not accustomed to. Ahab institutionalized wickedness. He expanded opportunities for others. By the time we get to Mount Carmel, where there's this confrontation between the prophets of Ahab and the gods that he's led the people into, because of the temples he built and the altars he set up, on Mount Carmel there's 450 prophets of Baal and another 400 prophets of Asherah. So he is supporting and institutionalizing wickedness that is leading the nation in a destructive place. Who leads makes a difference. Now in the very next chapter, God raises up a voice to stand in opposition to Ahab. Some of you know the story really well. Elijah the Tishbite. You'd have to be called by God if you have that name. There's a lot to overcome. <laughs> From Tishba in Gilead said to Ahab, Elijah goes and finds Ahab. And this is his message. As the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there'll be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Wow. This is an agricultural society. So they depend on the rain for their crops, for their economic well-being, as well as their food, for their livelihood. If there's no rain and there are no crops, it will devastate the economy. The people will be starving. And Elijah said, because of your choices, it won't rain again until I say so. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that Elijah thought it was okay to talk about current events? What if Elijah had just gathered the people together and said, I want to read to you the books of Moses and remind you about the Red Sea crossing. Let's talk about Joshua and the walls of Jericho falling. He had a wealth of information that he could have directed the people's attention towards. But he understood the Spirit of God saying to him, go speak to the king and say, if you continue to practice evil, it will bring devastation. I'm telling you, if you have the confidence in the Lord to make a declaration that it won't rain until I tell you it's going to rain, in my mind, I'm thinking you're better than Superman. You're faster than a speeding bullet. You can leap a building in a single bound. I don't remember the whole thing, but right? Look at the next sentence. It says, the word of the Lord came to Elijah, leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kerith Ravine, east of the Jordan. Excuse me? Go tell the king that the economy is going to be devastated, and the people are going to starve, and now go hide. Cross the Jordan River. 
I mean, he's going to have to make a quite a difficult journey. Go cross the Jordan River, hide in a ravine. You'll drink from the brook. I've directed the ravens to supply you with food there. So he did what the Lord told him. And he went to the ravine east of the Jordan and he stayed there. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. I'm taking a minute with it because <clears throat> it's difficult for me to reconcile. Hearing from the Lord with an authority that would speak to the direction of a nation. And then the Lord saying to you, you go hide and I'm going to have the ravens feed you. You see, I have either been coached towards or I fabricated of myself a sense of what it means to hear from the Lord. And it would not include hiding. I think it's an important point for us because there are times when speaking the truth will bring things to you other than applause. It will limit some invitations. And so much of our courage has been balanced against, well, what would the consequence be? Would everybody love me more if I spoke the truth? What if I said to someone that I cared about, it seems to me the pathway you're on is destructive have you considered it carefully? I don't really think I can support you in that. We wouldn't want to do that because it might disrupt a relationship. See, I, th I think we've been coached towards a whole set of behaviors and choices that lead us away from a lot of things we're invited towards in Scripture. Elijah, you go tell the king. I'm watching. And again, this isn't about pagan and this isn't godly and ungodly. These are the covenant people of God. If we used a New Testament analogy, this is everybody under the covenant. These are behaviors amongst the folk. This isn't an us and them discussion. In the very next verse, it says, sometime later the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Well, it hasn't rained now for months and months. The brook dried. It didn't dry up overnight. It dried up incrementally. Elijah's watching the brook dry up. He's watching the water flow diminish day after day after day. And the brook dried up. He has no water supply. That's not a problem that you can meditate on for four or five weeks. And after the brook dried up, in verse 8, it said, then. Then's a timing word. Then when? Then after the brook dried up. The word of the Lord came to him. He wants him to go someplace else. I'm reading that and I'm thinking, you know, Lord, it would have been better if three weeks ago, when the water flow was beginning to dwindle, you'd have given me next steps. Do you ever complain to God about his timing? I do enough for both of us. It's okay. <laughs> it's been my most persistent complaint to the Lord. It doesn't move him to change, but... It's been a portion of our relationship. After the brook dries up, the Lord gives Elijah his next directions. And this one's perhaps even more humbling than going to the hide in a ravine and being fed by the ravens. He sends him to a town, to a widow. He said, there's a widow in this town of Zarephath, and I've directed her to supply you with food. Well, that's an uplifting assignment. I mean, the bigger picture of Scripture says that we're to care for the widows and the orphans. And God sends the prophet Elijah to be cared for by the widow. Are you catching up yet? God's rewriting the script. See, I think, it would, couldn't he have just organized an intercessors group and prayed for King Ahab? I mean, did you really have to raise your hand and say... You can't do this. I won't be quiet. So he gets to the widows. You know the story. She doesn't have any food. And Elijah gives her some counsel that's awkward to read it. He said, go home and do as you said, but first make a small loaf of bread for me. Bring it to me and then make something for yourself. Before you feed yourself and your child, feed me. I know you're out of food, but before you eat, feed me. If you're not uncomfortable yet, I am. 
For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. God sent me here, and we're all going to eat well. And it's better than what the ravens were bringing, I guess. Now, this leads us in to this ongoing, this, his relationship in this household. There really is a point to this. In 1 Kings, it's the same chapter, verse 17. Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. And he grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. He died with Elijah in the house. Oh, come here by sitting so smug and quiet. If you had a prophet in your house that could make the rain stop, how many of you think you probably wouldn't need the pharmacy? That's my assumption, right? I mean, Elijah's kind of connected. He can see things. He can see the hills filled with the... I mean, he can, he's aware. He's, he knows there's a God. God sends him to challenge kings. And your kid's got the sniffles. You think, this is not a problem. Elijah's going to pray. I'm not alone in this, right? Amen. You do this Bible reading? It made me uncomfortable, and I know the story. The boy stops breathing, and the mother reacts in the way I would expect. She said to Elijah, what do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? And Elijah said, give me your son. And he took him from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and he laid him on the bed. And then Elijah cried out to the Lord, have you brought tragedy even on this widow I'm staying with by causing her son to die? <laughs> Elijah basically says to God what the woman said to him. Are you kidding me? You sent me to a widow to be cared for and her son died? Now what's absent is the word of the Lord saying to Elijah, have him stand on his feet and clap your hands over his head. There's no answer. So Elijah stretched himself out on the boy three times. And he cried to the Lord, Lord, my God, let this boy's life return to him. And then there's this little kind of obscure phrase in verse 22. The Lord heard Elijah's cry. And the, boy returned, the boy's life returned to him. And he lived. And Elijah picked up the child and he carried him down from the room into the house and he gave him to his mother and said, look, the Bible's so understated. Hey, look, your kid's alive. <laughs> it's the best snapshot I have seen in a while of what real intercession is. God didn't tell Elijah to pray for that boy. If Elijah hadn't prayed, that child's destiny would have been different. See, when we talk about intercession, we talk about convening a prayer group. We talk about maybe having a theme. We might even expend, extend the time a little bit from 15 minutes to 20. But the Bible invites us towards something a bit different. Intercession is something that requires persistence and perseverance. If we're praying a prayer that doesn't get answered immediately, it's possible that it's, it's not, the, the, the reason for that is, is not because our prayer isn't in the will of God. There is significant biblical information to suggest that it could be because there's a satanic prince in the heavenlies standing in the way. And it will require a response from us. We have to pray him out of the way. See, we've been told that prayer is this polite thing. We do at public gatherings or before we eat or before we teach, the, we teach the children to pray before they go to sleep. Or if there is some unexpected life crisis, you know, maybe we should pray or call somebody that is more comfortable with praying than we are. But the cultivation of prayer, building it into the routine of our lives, to have the imagination that when you pray, it affects weather patterns. 
You're willing enough to believe that the light bulbs you use in your home affect weather patterns. Because some knucklehead talking head someplace tells you so. You're willing to believe that the, the emissions from your gas stove affect weather patterns. Come on, it's science. But we're, we struggle to believe that our prayers could have an impact. Well, pastor, now you're just gone too far. So I want to take the balance of our time, and we're going to look at a bit of Scripture and see if we can glean some instructions on becoming an intercessor. We don't have a lot of backstory on Elijah. We'll have to ask him when we see him, because there's no doubt that he was. His prayers made a difference in the, in the history of a nation. Do you have room for that in your imagination? We're ahead of the story, but you know the Mount Carmel confrontation where he calls the nation to repentance, but it's the outcome of his prayers, his courage, his boldness, his determination, his willingness to be an outcast, his willingness to hide in a ravine, his willingness to hide in a widow's home and take the last food she has. His whole life has been disrupted because of his faith. See, that's not the approach we've taken to faith. We don't even want to talk about our faith. We don't want to have the conversation with our family and our friends because it could be disruptive. We don't want to talk about it in terms of what's happening in our nation, or certainly we don't want to mix it with a, a political discussion. The cowardice that has crept into our faith is unacceptable. We need the church to be the church. We're going to have to find the courage to say there's right and wrong and there's good and evil and we will not accommodate evil. Well, I, I, one of the best places I know for learning instructions about intercession is from Daniel and it's because we have a bit of insight into his journey. We meet Daniel as a very young man, most likely a teenager. And there's a couple of things I'll tell you about Daniel, and we'll look at some scriptures that will make it clear. Daniel did not leave the initiative with the enemy. He didn't leave the initiative with his adversaries. But Daniel himself chose the battleground of prayer. Now, admittedly, he chose that battleground because it was the best option available to him. And one of the reasons I would submit to you that we have not learned to pray is we've imagined we've had other avenues available to us. We've trusted the Constitution or the Bill of Rights or the justice of our federal institutions or the strength of our economy or the ability to, to have free speech. Well, those things are crumbling before our very eyes. They're being removed from us one after the other. And if we haven't developed a meaningful prayer life and a confidence in our prayer life, it is time to begin. Amen. Now, there's two complementary elements in Daniel's life that are worth tagging, I think, before we begin with the Scripture. He cultivated a prayer life from his youth. You, you learn the story in Sunday school. He was willing to face the, the den filled with lions rather than forfeit his daily prayer time. Are you kidding me? He thought prayer was so valuable, so important, so essential to his well-being that if it meant he was put in a life-threatening position, it was worth risking that rather than disrupt his prayer. I would humbly submit we don't hold prayer in that same place. Secondly, Daniel didn't limit his prayers to his own ideas. He just didn't pray about what he knew or what he thought about or what he wanted. Daniel committed significant energy and effort into praying what he learned from studying God's Word. I'll give you one example in Daniel 9. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the Scriptures, according to the Word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. Daniel is a slave in a foreign country. He, He's not living in Jerusalem. And by studying the, the book of Jeremiah or a scroll of the prophet Jeremiah, 
He understood that they were only going to be out of Israel for 70 years. He did the math and he knew it's about time to go home. So it said, I turned to the Lord and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting, in sackcloth and ashes. Not because of a personal need. Daniel had a good job. He had power and prestige and privilege and many things. But when he saw God's word holding something in front of him, he began to fast and pray in pursuit of the fulfillment of that initiative. He's an intercessor. Now, I read you a chapter from near the end of the story. I want to go back to the beginning of the development of that intercessor, some insights into Daniel's character. In Daniel chapter 1 and verse 5, he and his friends are newly arrived in Babylon. They've been recruited because of their story and their presentation to serve, perhaps, the king. And it says, the king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table, and they were to be trained for three years. And after that, they were to enter the king's service. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in that way. I don't think that's a commentary on the king's wine. I'm not endorsing it, but I don't think that's what that is. I think it's Daniel going to honor the dietary rules that he's been given and his people have been given all the way back to Moses. And he's doing it significant risk to himself. If he makes the request and he's kicked out of the program he's in, he'll be left to fend for himself amongst the slaves. Again, I want, you, I want to begin to try to, to realign this notion that we should capitulate to every request of wickedness. Daniel raised his hand and said, I would like permission to have my own diet, not to eat that. And the man responsible for him understood the dynamics of an ancient Near Eastern monarch. This is not a democracy. It's not egalitarian. It's not one person, one vote. There is an absolute authority, and on a whim, they can sever your head. And the man responsible for those being trained to go into the service of the king is frightened by Daniel's request. He said, listen, if I let you adjust the diet and you get sick, it'll cost me my life. So they strike a bargain a little test period. And at the end of the test period, Daniel looks better. He and his friends look better than the rest. But I want you to see his, he's going to honor God. He could have been bitter, angry, resentful. He's not going to get to graduate from Jerusalem High School. He's not going to get to go to the University of Israel. He's going to miss their football games in the fall. He's not going to get to go to their spring baseball games. He's going to miss the family pilgrimage to the temple in Jerusalem. All the dreams that were a part of his family for generations are not available to him. They are gone. His inheritance is gone. His family home is gone. His friends have been slaughtered. And he's serving the king that orchestrated all of that. He has every reason to be angry or bitter filled with hate, mad at God. And he's so determined to honor the Lord, he's concerned about what's going on his fork. So as we talk about becoming an intercessor, I would start by acknowledging that we'll have to yield a bit of our dreams and say, Lord, I would rather please you than ask you to please me. I'll give time and energy and effort to honoring you in my life. I'm willing to be different for you. Are you with me? Amen. Daniel's going to change the course of nations. Now, the opposition comes often, but it starts really early. The very next chapter, Daniel's execution is ordered. Now, it's cleverly wrapped up in the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. But it's not difficult for me to imagine. It's an attack from Satan himself. He wants to eliminate Daniel. He wanted to murder all the babies in Bethlehem. He wants to shut down anybody that determines to honor the Lord. I don't want you to live in fear of the enemy. I want you to be aware of the conflict around us. If you go to work and they say, don't bring your Bible in here, why are we surprised? If we have a nation with a Christian heritage, 
And we have a wave of leaders over a period of time that says, we're going to redefine family. Why are we surprised? Do we think that doesn't have to be protected? Do we think we won't have to use our voices? Do we think the enemy would allow us to broadcast to the whole world that Jesus is Lord and these are the principles that will help you institutionalize that without it being challenged? What has caused us to be so overwhelmingly naive? Because we haven't really had to trust the Lord. Because we've imagined we could secure our children's future for ourselves. We could give them enough experience and provide them with enough education and give them a, a big enough of a resource boost. So we've been quiet. The commander of the king's guard came. He went out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, but Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. He wasn't obnoxious and hateful and pounding the table. Doesn't mean you love the Lord because you're obnoxious. But doesn't mean you're more godly if you capitulate. He asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? And the man explained the matter to Daniel, and this Daniel went to the king, and he asked for time. Again, he puts his life on the line. You know from the book of Esther, if you go to the king without being invited into the king's presence, and the king doesn't welcome you, you're done. Well, Daniel's done tomorrow anyway. He might as well go ask. So he goes to the king. Folks, we're going to have to find some courage to stand up. He went to the king. I mean, it's a simple little sentence, but it means so much. He went to the king and he asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. Now he's done it. If you give me a little time, I'll tell you your dream. So Daniel returned to his house and he explained the matter to his friends. Yeah, I bet he did. He's going to call a little prayer group. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery. What do you want about this? It's not the first time they've prayed. What do you want about it? It's not the first time they've stood together. They were in on the diet plan with him. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. The Bible's understatement, and Daniel praised the God of heaven. How do you think he did it? Oh, God, thanks. Appreciate you cluing me in on the king's dream. I bet there was a little more emotion. What do you think? Amen. You think he went and found his friends? Do you think they were praying? I bet they were. Intercession, intercessors. It doesn't stop there in Daniel 3, the very next chapter. Nebuchadnezzar gets the idea to build a statue made of gold of himself. Of course he did. And he wants everybody to worship his statue. Do you think conventional wisdom is new? Well, leaders want everybody to think the same way and talk the same way and walk the same way. Do you really think that's a new idea? Do you think Google and Amazon dropping things into your social media feeds and your internet feeds, do you think that's like a new, I mean, the technology's new, but the principle of manipulation has been around as long as there's been people. Think the way we tell you to think and believe the way we tell you to believe and do what we tell you to do and shut up and hurry. And in Nebuchadnezzar's case, he said, if you don't do it, I'll kill you. And he was credible because everybody cooperated, except these three Jewish kids, Daniel's friends. This is the second attempt on their life, and we're only in chapter 3 of the book. And they, they get an audience with the king, and they said, we don't need to defend ourselves. If we're thrown into the furnace, the God we serve can deliver us. And he'll deliver us from your majesty's hands. They're being kind of respectful. But even if he doesn't, you should know your majesty. We're not going to serve your gods. Well, now, wait a minute. They've got an audience with the king. Couldn't they build the bridge? Wasn't this time for some inclusive language? 
I mean, they're going to offend him. They're being so judgy. Nobody likes judgy foreigners. Think of all the other Jewish people. You're going to turn attention on them. If he burns you, he's going to start looking for us. Somebody go get to those guys. King, the God we worship can deliver us from you, but you should really understand, even if he doesn't, we can't bow to your statue. King lost it. He goes on to say, he was so angry, it transformed his appearance. He had the furnace superheated. You know the story. The guys that threw him in the furnace got killed. And the king is so perverse, he wants to go watch him burn. So he's looking down into the furnace, and he says, wait, didn't we put three men in there, and now there's four, and the fourth looks like the Son of God, and the other three are having fun? But we're not done with the opposition. It takes a different form. So that's chapter 3. By chapter 4, the king has a dream. And Daniel gets tagged to interpret the dream. This is the interpretation, your majesty. This is the decree the Most High has issued against my lord the king. You'll be driven away from people, and you'll live with the wild animals, and you'll eat grass like an ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Hello? You're going to go tell an ancient Near Eastern monarch he's going to live like an animal and eat grass? How many you want to deliver that message in the halls of Congress? You don't want to deliver that message to one of your kids at the table because it's going to ruin the evening. Well, Drew King, I know you had a dream, and I'm sure God is good. And the sky is blue, and the fish swim in the sea. Bless you. Daniel doesn't stop. I didn't give you the whole passage, but I, put you, I gave you the punchline in verse 27. Therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right. And renounce your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. And it may be then your prosperity will continue. Daniel told the king to repent of his wickedness. Well, couldn't we just do a Bible study? (laughs) But it's opposition. I'm telling you, if you're living it out, it's not once in a great while. It begins at the beginning of the story, and it continues in the second chapter, in the third chapter, in the fourth chapter. Big surprise, it continues in chapter 5. Nebuchadnezzar's gone. His son has come to the throne. His name is Belshazzar. Listen to what Daniel says. He says he sees handwriting on the wall. They're having a, a drunken party, and they've... They've brought in the cups and the bowls from the temple in Jerusalem because they can. And now there's handwriting on the wall. And doesn't some, isn't there anybody here that's Jewish? Yeah, there's that one guy your dad liked. Well, go get him. And they bring in Daniel. So he's got a new king. You, Belshazzar, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all of this about your dad. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. How many of you think Daniel's, his courage button worked? (laughs) You ignored what God showed your father. And you have set yourself up against God. You had the goblins from his temple brought to you. And you and your nobles and your wives, you... You praise the gods of silver and gold and bronze and wood and stone. They can't see or hear. But you did not honor the God who holds in his hands your life and all your ways. You didn't honor God. Understand, he's not Jewish. He doesn't know the Red Sea story. He doesn't know the plagues on Egypt. He doesn't know about manna and water from a rock. And he doesn't know about Ten Commandments on a mountain. 
And he doesn't know about Jericho, and he doesn't know about the tribal. He doesn't know. And Daniel says to him, you did not honor God. But he doesn't leave it at that. He said, God holds your life in his hands. And now I'm going to tell you what those words on the wall mean. I didn't put it in your notes. You can check me. This was Daniel's message to him. God has numbered your days. And he's going to bring your reign to an end. You have been weighed in the balance. And you've been found wanting. And your kingdom is going to be given to the Medes and the Persians, to another empire. Daniel said to him, you are done. Now, in fairness, if you don't know the narrative, the king gave him a position of authority. For what it was worth, he lost his empire that night. Remember the lesson. It, it's intercession. What's it be a, to mean to become a person whose prayers make a difference? It doesn't mean you're a closet Christian. It doesn't mean you just are always appeasing every expression of wickedness and ungodliness. You can be respectful. You can be wise. Folks, how long will we give our support emotionally and financially to expressions of wickedness? This isn't confusing in our nation at the national level. It isn't about individuals. It's about platforms. It's written down. You know what they're going to do. At the local level, it's somewhat different. It's far more about individuals and character. But at the national level, there's a platform. The people that are selected have to enact that platform. It's the only way they get funding and support. And so we come up with this convoluted stuff. You know, well, I'm not a one-issue person. Baloney. You are if the issue matters to you. And then we argue about incidentals to, def to deflect our own idolatry. It's unbelievable. There's a price to be paid. In Daniel 6, very next chapter, Daniel learned that the decree has been published. He went to his home upstairs to pray. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to God, just as he'd done. Then men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for it. It's illegal. They said, you can't do that. So Daniel opens his windows and prayed three times a day. He knows what's coming. He's done. Oh, by the way, I know the end of the story. I went to Sunday school too. God sent an angel to close the mouths of the lions. It was the one day the lions weren't hungry. Until the accusers got tossed in there, and then they got ravenous. But the real lesson, that we've been walking through this. We've been watching it. It looks like kings oppose Daniel, and jealous officials oppose Daniel. But if you follow the narrative, by the time we get to chapter 10, we recognize that there's actually opposition in the heavens. Remember our context, spiritual warfare. That what happens in the earth reflects what's happening in the heavens. And the church has just stepped away from this because we could control our futures and our circumstances well enough with what's happening on the earth. But in Daniel chapter 10, this is that we read chapter 9 where he repented for the sins of the people. He said, after that, I mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips. I used no lotions until the three weeks were over. Three weeks of diligently seeking the Lord. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing by the bank of the river, the Tigris, I looked up, and before me was a man dressed in linen. There's an angel there. Verse 13, the angel, it took the angel, the angel explained to Daniel, he said, it took me three weeks to get here. Because the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, Michael is an archangel, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now, I've come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future, for the vision concerns a time yet to come. Michael is the archangel attached to the Jewish people. When you find him in the scripture, you'll usually find something happening with the Jewish people. But Daniel fasts and prays for three weeks, and an angel comes to see him. And so the moment you began to pray, I was dispatched with a message for you, but for three weeks there was a battle in the heavens. 
When we started this discussion, I said Daniel began this commitment to pray as a young person. Teach your children to pray. Let them see you pray. Let them understand the significance you attach to pray. It's far more powerful than what you say to them. Let them see it. If you're going to teach them to sing Rocky Top, please teach them the value of prayer. And I'm not opposed to Rocky Top, often. But after three weeks, the angel said, I'm here. And when I go back, there'll be a, more, a greater battle. Folks, there is a battle in the heavens these days. There is a battle. The church in our nation has an assignment. We have more freedom, more liberty, more resources. We have had greater privilege than any expression of the church and the earth in our generation. There are many places in the world where the church is under tremendous persecution and pressure, where Christians are being hunted, where their resources are shut off and they don't have freedom and they certainly don't have technology. And we've been so distracted, we've taken the bait. We've worshiped other gods of comfort and convenience and popularity and pleasure, which leads us into immorality and greed and envy and covetousness. It's never enough. We're never satisfied. We'll climb over every godly boundary we know in pursuit of some selfish agenda. And then there's enough voices that say, well, you can tell the Lord you're kind of sorry. And we wonder why our freedoms and our liberties are collapsing. Why our wealth is evaporated before our very eyes. Why we have leaders that betray us to other nations and won't enforce our borders. And it's not about a party, they're all the same. They'll have another hearing and give their sound bites and nothing will happen and they'll betray you more completely. And they'll give us bread and send us to the circus and act as if we don't know. Lord, help us. Church, there's a battle in the heavenlies. And we've been arguing about translations and worship styles and whether or not the role we believe about this or we will quibble about the most insignificant things and refuse to use our voice to say to one another, let's honor the Lord. God is moving in the earth. I believe that in the most profound ways. And I want to invite you to allow the Spirit of God to disrupt you, to change your habits and your patterns and your relationships and your routines, to build some new ones. Stop winking at evil. It's true, there are no perfect Christians. But there's a difference in struggling with our, our carnality and doing our best to overcome it and to put it to death and engaging in ungodliness, and you know the difference. Stop excusing it. I brought you a prayer. I want to give you an invitation before that. I started on Wednesday night, but I want to continue it. I want to invite you to take Wednesdays through the end of September, if you're inclined, and join us in fasting and prayer. We're in a season where there is a realignment taking place, and I don't know what the outcome will be, but I, I, I'm convinced that the next 12 months will be a tremendous, make a tremendous determination in that. And I'd like to be in front of that. So I want to invite you on Wednesdays to join us in fasting and praying. I'm not a legalist. If Wednesdays is not good for your schedule, any day works. But on Wednesdays, we're typically together, and we can pray together at the end of a day of fasting. Do what makes sense for your health. All right? If that's a meal for you, that's great. If it means you can fast till 4 o'clock and eat an evening meal, good for you. You do what makes sense for you. Fasting is abstaining from food for spiritual purposes. Take the time you would normally spend in preparing and enjoying a meal and seek the Lord. If you're at work, maybe there's a coworker who's a believer, and you can take a time to pray. Download a prayer from the sermon. Get one of the battle plans off the outline. There's all kinds of prayers available. Read Daniel's prayer in Daniel chapter 9. Read the, the, the prayers that Paul prayed with the Ephesian church in the book of the Ephesians. You have lots of prayers. 
If you're at work, pull in a friend. If you're at home, perhaps you do it as a family. If you're a small group, how, however you choose to do that. But let's take Wednesdays and begin to seek the Lord. Let's begin to cultivate some skills in seeking the Lord that we have not had in our portfolio. Amen. Say, well, I'm a, I'm a mature Christian. I, oh, good. I'm, I'm happy. Let's grow. Amen. Let's grow. Okay? That's voluntary. You don't have to be in Tennessee to do that. Wherever you're listening or watching from, join us. All right? I brought you a prayer. Let's stand together. They'll put it on the screens. I didn't have room on your outline. Imagine that. Never happened before. All right, together. Almighty God, nothing is hidden from you. You know even our thoughts and motives. Forgive us of our apathy toward your will. Forgive us for our surrender to this present age. We repent and turn our hearts to you. May the fear of the Lord grow within us. Bring a new anointing upon us, a new boldness to speak the truth and to stand for righteousness. Deliver us from evil. May your kingdom be done on earth as in heaven. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you.